Good day, fellow investors. I recently had the pleasure to have a chat with Tristan from Cooper Academy, and this is just a short intro to the discussion on investing strategy that you can find also here, but also check out his YouTube channel as there are really, really great informative videos, and I really love his videos on Warren Buffett that are really a great source of education and you can also see how many others love them with 5 million, 2 million views there. Really well put together, really well put videos on investing and on understanding how things work. Enjoy his channel and enjoy our chat. Hello everyone. So Today I have with me Sven Carlin. If you're a value investor and you enjoy watching YouTube, you probably already know who he is. He uh, he runs, I believe it's the largest value investing channel on YouTube. It's got over 200,000 subscribers. Sven has been in the investing game for around 20 years. He's got a PhD where he studied stock market risk. He was previously a lecturer in accounting and finance. He's worked for Bloomberg. But now he is an independent researcher, investor through YouTube and his stock market platform. And I can't remember where I saw this and it was a couple of years ago, but I don't know if it was on your YouTube channel or on the, the, the research page, but uh, I believe you shared your past returns and I, and I remember they were, they were really impressive. So um, he's got a good track record of... Um, Impressive value investing. So, Sven, it's uh, really good to have you on Cooper Academy. You're the third guest Thank to come you. on. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, you're, you're the third guest to come on. I have had, I don't know if you know someone called Investing with Tom. He's a value investor from New Zealand. All and, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the Plain I've seen Bagel. Videos. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the Plain Bagel I've had on as well. There's really kind of two key themes that I wanted to dig into with this interview. Um, and the, the main kind of one was how you invest, how you choose stocks, how you think about them. And then also next theme is also your thoughts on what's going on in the market in 2022 and kind of how to handle it. So that's what we're going to try to cover today. So Perfect, first, perfect. Okay. First, first question. How do you go about choosing the stocks that you want to look at? I know Warren Buffett, he used to scan through the Moody's manual when he was a young investor. So I'm just thinking, you know, in the modern day, what do you do? Are you watching CNBC, reading articles online, watching YouTube videos or something to get ideas of stocks to buy? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, the first thing is let's not talk about stocks because. I'm not looking at stocks to buy. And whenever I go and look for stocks that are interesting or hot or stocks to buy, it's usually the wrong way to go. I prefer looking at businesses. So businesses to own. And then you look, okay, how is this business working for me? And if you can shift that mentality when you're approaching investing, then you are on the right path. Yeah. Because if you're focused on stocks, then you're focused, okay, will this stock go up? Will the stock do this? Which then is impossible to predict because you cannot predict how the market will feel in the next six months, next year or something like that. But if you yeah. focus on the business, you look at what the business is doing and then compare it to the price that you have to pay for what you get from the business, then everything is much, much easier because I cannot predict where the stock market will go. Yeah, so it's, a, it's quite a big sort of shift in mentality from thinking about things from, no, you're not, you're buying a stock, but you're actually, you got to think about it as if you're buying a business. Because I guess sometimes yes. if, if you're thinking, if you're buying a stock, maybe you concentrate too much on the price, like what's happening with the price, the stock is just the price and yeah. For example, let's discuss Google. So the stock price is a little bit lower now. And now everyone is so focused on that stock price. Will mm. it go back to where it was a few months ago? Where I make 20%? And then my question is, okay, and if that happens, if you make your 20%, what then? 
because then you're again in the same problem. But if you start thinking, okay, where will Google be five to 10 years from now? What kind of business, how much money it will make for me? And then you compare it to the price and then you're focused on the business. And then you look at 100 similar situations, similar businesses. From those 100, I'm sure you will find a few that will fit your investment style perfectly. So to, to fight, like to actually find the businesses, like what are you doing? Do you, how do you find them in the first place? You know, do you, are you just reading well, through a bunch of them? I go, I usually do that depending on where I'm in the research process, but I, yes, read through thousands of businesses. So the last thing that I looked, I looked at the MSCI small cap index. So I looked at all 3,500 small caps on the list, one by one. So if it is an interesting businesses, I usually skip those that I'm not interested, like finance and pharma, because I'm not a specialist. And then I look if there is something interesting there. And from the 3,500, I found 15 that were interesting. I make a small analysis and I follow them over time, see if those fit my list of about 30 to 50 stocks that I follow constantly. And from those, I select the ones that are the best at the moment. Uh, that sounds like very Buffett-like. Because I remember when reading when Buffett was younger, he used to just go through the Moody's manual and go through like all these businesses, you know? Yeah. Um, and you never always find something uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, because... Usually you find the best things where others are not looking. And that can be because others are not interested, not informed yet, or have very, very negative sentiment. And then as you follow things over a longer period of time, you start start understanding, okay, this is now very interesting, but the market hates it because of this or that. Um, is it normally like patterns that you notice why the market starts hating a stock is it just often the market hates a stock and starts hating it even more if it goes down uh... if the stock goes up it's incredible so if a stock goes up then everybody starts loving it and the bullish thesis becomes even more bullish there are more things that make the bullish thesis true on the contrary, when a stock starts to going down, people start hating it even more. They start finding news about it that are terrible, whatever, and that it pushes even lower and lower and lower until it hits that, let's say, value bottom that, okay, much lower than this. It can go much lower, but at least not for a longer period of time. Right. For example, uh, from... Um, if you focus on commodities, commodities are either loved or hated. So now that copper prices are above $4 a pound, everybody loves copper. But two years ago, when copper was at $2 a mm. pound, everybody hated copper. But if you look at the industry, we all consume it, we all use it, we all need it. The demand is pretty stable. So it's pretty easy to just follow also these cycles, commodities, countries, businesses, sectors. And if you have a long list of stocks, then it's pretty easy to understand when something is cheaper, when something is more expensive. So um, I'm guessing you don't believe in, I remember at some universities they would teach, I think the theory is called uh, like oh, efficient market hypothesis. Yes. That, that's like... Can't be true. <laughs> the efficient market hypothesis is usually true in that second. But so the market is, the market price is reflecting what the market thinks about it. All right. the information that are available at the moment in that second. But if you start thinking from a longer period of time, so what can happen? Interest rates can go up or down. There will be a recession. And when you start putting in those probabilities, the market is definitely not efficient because people just look at stock prices going up and down and not at long-term 
risk and reward. Right. So longer term, the market is not efficient. On a daily okay. basis, you can say, okay, the market reacts to news, et cetera, et cetera. That's the big difference. I guess the second question is, once you find a stock, what, what are the first things that you look for in it? It's the things that make you think, uh, maybe I want to buy it or no, like definitely I don't want to buy this stock. Uh, I always look for the quality of the business. So business, yeah, uh, say that. what is the... What's the quality of the business? What's the competition? And what is the risk that the business will be hit in the next year, five years, 10 years? So I'm always looking, okay, how is the business? What's the strength of the business now and how strong it will be in the future? That's the key. If you have a strong business with the mode that it's unlikely that others will be able to compete with it, lower its margins, etc. Then you're already a step ahead because it's unlikely that you will lose money by investing at a fair price. For example, if we look at Google again, as we started with Google, so what's the likelihood that you are not going to use search or not watch YouTube anymore, watch something else? And yeah. uh, as Google grew and built its moat, let's say, it's very, very difficult for others to come and take away that uh, moat over time. And then yes. the question is, okay, what's the risk? How much can Google grow as a business from this perspective? And then always compare it to the price that you have to pay for it. Mm. And how do you find with when it comes to predicting how strong it will be in the future does that just come from having a really good uh, base knowledge of the underlying business and that's one so you have to understand the business the sector and what the business what the management is doing to strengthen that business so if you look at businesses today maybe they don't have profits now but if they're reinvesting everything into the business that means that they will be also likely strong in the future because if you are the one that invests the most then others will not be able to chip away from that uh, let's say moat that you are building mm. is that often a sign that you like if you see a business reinvesting all their profits or do you like a bit of a dividend as well uh, doesn't really matter of course in the long term it's all about the business creating value for you that's creating cash that's creating dividends and then either you reinvest them or warren buffett reinvests them yeah. for you but at the end it is about creating those cash flows but if the business can reinvest at a high return on investment invested capital that's great mm -hmm. however management is always incentivized to invest no matter the return on invested capital because the bigger the business is the bigger the salary of the manager will be so really? that's something to be very careful because if a manager has i don't know mm -hmm. a jet that's x big if they buy another company and have double the employees, he can buy a twice larger airplane to fly around. That's his incentive. So that's also something you have to be careful about. I guess um, some of that has to come down to trusting the manager a bit, uh, getting a feel for his values or her values. And also, also, yes, of course, looking at what they have done in the past because usually there is a pattern. So yeah. if you will listen to conference calls or today you have all those transcripts available, then you can see what the analyst, what the management has been saying a few years back mm. and how that has evolved. Mm. That's always important. So if I look at the business and it, let's say it's a new business, I'm interesting and then I go, okay, the business is there, the cash flows, the this, the that. And then I look, okay, what has the management been saying a few years ago and how has that evolved? And that's mm -hmm. always something that you can say, okay, they were saying this, this, and this, and now they are saying mm -hmm. something completely different. That means they have no idea, which means it will be ugly. And uh, 
if you feel that it's going to be ugly, would you normally just be like, okay, next stock? Next, next. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if the business itself was like really um, sort of juicy, like if if you thought the underlying business was really good, but the management was a bit off. But if the management is off, then also the business will be likely shaky. Maybe there will be some temporary, temporary uh, good numbers. Like we have yeah. seen with all these businesses these days that have benefited from the pandemic, like the Pelotons, the Zooms, the this. Yeah. So the market a year ago was thinking that these companies will grow forever because there is an acceleration of the going towards tech, etc. But it was clear that it was just an acceleration for a short period of time. And as soon as things return to normal, yes, we are on a higher level but the growth rates are not as stellar as those were. And so if the management changed things in their growth perspective, because of the pandemic, invested more into everlasting growth, then you see that they are just following trends and not yeah. focusing on the core business. Yeah, I just remember reading something, I think it was either Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger. He said, like, you kind of want to buy a business that... Uh... Something like you want to buy a business that a dummy can run or something? Yes, that an idiot, idiot can run. And now that they are both over 90, that a person with dementia can run. So with that what? if he forgets to go to work, that it's still going on well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if he ever bought a, bought a stock like that. But I guess he's just, that's just an example. He's saying just get the business model so good. He's not really talking about the management that much. He's, he's still, one of his things is he still wants a good manager anyway, right? Yes, you always want a good manager, but also, for example, his largest position now is Apple. So uh, why he bought Apple? Because Apple built such a strong ecosystem. And once you start using Apple products, it's unlikely that you will switch to something else, yeah. which means that you will buy a phone, you will buy this, as the cycle goes, two, three years, you will buy a new phone. And those cash flows are pretty, pretty predictable. Plus, you have the option if Apple invents something new, that it explodes. But who is the CEO of Apple now that they have already built that ecosystem doesn't really matter for investors. Mm. Because if it's Tim Cook or someone else that does buybacks or this or that, those are not, let's say, crazy people. Mm. So it uh, doesn't really matter. When it was a small company where you need a visionary like Steve Jobs, that was different. But now it's already so huge, so established, right. so strong, 100 billion of cash flows. Maybe I can even run it and it should st still be good. Mm. <laughs> so so that is that, that also something you generally kind of want in a business? like? You kind of want the cash flows to be as predictable as quite consistent and a, a strong base? Or uh, I want that the cash flow power, the creation of cash flow that is, let's say, sustainable over the long term. Yeah. Because the best time to buy a business is when there are no cash flows, where there is no PE ratio, where everything looks ugly. That's the, usually the best time to buy the business. But if the business fundamentals are strong and the business will survive the recession, the cycle has no debt, then you know that in the future, it's extremely likely that the business will make cash flows. Mm. So usually those businesses that are stable in cash flows do well no matter what, those are usually fairly priced. Like we said, Google, and you will never buy Google cheap you might see the stock cheaper but it will never be extremely cheap because mm -hmm. it's such a great business so if you look with other companies especially with cyclical companies like miners or something like that car makers the best time to buy them is when they are not making any money but if you know how the cycle goes you know that sometimes in the future if it is a good business, low leverage, quality of, uh, re let's say, quality of the ore, if we are speak speaking of commodities, then you know that sometimes in the future they will make money.
Um, so with those those type of businesses, uh, especially if they are like not making money, obviously they can be a lot harder to predict. Like uh, if you're thinking like the 2000 dot com thing, and like a lot of them weren't making money. Obviously, there was some opportunities in some of those companies, like Amazon, would have been a great buy back then, and all that. Um, the, so the harder to predict. How do you kind of work your way around that? When I I don't. So those are bets. So I'm betting that companies like uh, I don't know Beyond Meat that was a hot stock. I'm betting that at some point, somewhere in time, it will reach scale, it will reach pro profitability, it will reach being a quality business, and it will reach, let's say, a moat-worthy place in the market. And those are so many bets, so many miracles need to happen for that company to make money that I simply say no. Too much. But let's say iron ore prices crash because there is a global recession and rio tinto the iron ore miner makes zero in cash flow in a bad year they have the mines they have the production they have everything they have the logistics they have all in place as demand picks up do i know that they will make money that's very likely and all i'm concerned is that they don't go bankrupt in a bad year but the market will hate it, the hate the company when there is a bad year. So I guess that is a real key, just to make sure they won't go bankrupt. So I guess one of the things would be they kind they kind of should be staying away from large amounts of debt and stuff like that. Peter Lynch said it in his book: uh, if you have no debt, it's very difficult to go bankrupt. Yeah, true. Do many yeah, of the. So are many of them very lowly leveraged, like copper companies and ore companies? Depends on the company. So if a company has just finished the project, then usually they have a lot of leverage. But if the company is uh, conservative, which means that when times are good, conservative companies, stock prices go up slowly because everyone is chasing those crazy growth companies that make acquisitions that take debt, that take leverage, because in a bull market, it's smart to take leverage. However, when things revert, if you have too much debt, then you are uh, really in a difficult position. And that's always the risk and reward of investing. Are you going to take advantage of the trend and bet on things going well for longer, or you're going to be more conservative? Yeah, I, I um, I love that risk reward, uh, mind frame of thinking about investing. I remember, I don't know if it was a, a banner on your YouTube channel, or still might be. I don't know, a couple of years ago, and I've always kind of thought about investing that way. It really helped me anyway when I started. Low being able risk, because yeah, low risk, high reward. Because that's the yes. essence of value investing. So, the lower is the risk. So, which means. I cannot lose, the higher will be your reward. That's, again, totally opposite to what uh, academia says. Academia says high risk, high reward. With value investing, is completely opposite. Low risk means high reward. So mm -hmm. when I'm buying something that the value of it by itself is much lower than uh, the value of it by itself is much higher than the stock price, then it's unlikely that I'm going to lose over time, which means when things return to normal, I make a lot of money. So I was wondering, do you have some key sort of ratios or any numbers and stuff that you look at? The problem with ratios is always that those are fast looking. So now if you look at companies, stocks have been going down lately and those ratios are looking great. Price earnings ratios of 9, 8 for banks, insurance of 20 for Google. So really good numbers. We say, okay, this stock is cheap, but those ratios are based on a great 2021. 
So that's always with True. ratios is this, okay, those tell me about the past of the company, but not mm-hmm. about the future. And the future is on what your investment performance will depend. Yeah. So it's always about trying to estimate what the business will make in the future and then compare that to the current price. Of course, looking at past numbers helps you estimating the future. So of course, you start with that. But I'm not saying that if a stock is at the price earnings ratio of nine, it is much better than a stock that is a price earnings ratio of 100. Yeah. It all depends on the business. Yeah. Because I, I have had people ask me, oh, so what should I look for in a PE ratio and stuff like that? But it's it's a bit of a tough question. But... No, it's, uh, it's, it's assuming stability. It's assuming that right. the best would replicate itself in the future, which is which might be the issue or not be the issue. So, but if you can find a business that is stable where you can predict cash flows that are likely going to be stable, then okay, you can say, okay, the price earnings ratio is really low, too low for this company Mm. for the long-term quality of it. And it is ridiculously cheap. Apple 2016, I remember writing an article how Apple at the price earnings ratio of 10, it's ridiculously cheap. In March 2020, uh, I made a video saying how you will not see Berkshire trading at the price earnings ratio of 10 that soon again, which made it a great opportunity. And why that? Because Berkshire's earnings are pretty stable. It's a huge business. And it has ups and downs, but those ups and downs of all those small businesses are pretty, pretty stable. So Berkshire in a bad year will make 25 billion, in a good year will make 35 billion. Mm. The variability isn't that big, but the stock price does go up and down. And uh, when the price earnings ratio is close to 10, it's a remarkable buy. Well, was it at 10 in, in 2016? Uh, 20, uh, Apple was at 10 in 2016 and Berkshire was at 10 in 2020. Really? I didn't even see yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 10. When you calculate all the cash flows and earnings the businesses Berkshire makes, it, yeah. made, it makes about 36 billion per year and the market capitalization was 360, 340 billion. Mm-hmm. So the price earnings ratio was 10 for a company like Berkshire. Now it's likely 20 already. Oh, so was that um, after that crash in the pandemic? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. because everyone was expected that they will make, won't make any money. And yeah. that was the possibility. For 2020, Berkshire could have also made 10 billion. But then you know the company and you know that over the long term, on average, Berkshire will make 30 billion, 35 billion, and likely grow that earning base for 5%, 6% per year. Yeah. So when that business is trading at a P of 10, you don't have to think much about it. Mm. I guess the important thing is just to make to make very sure that it is um going to be consistent. Because sometimes you'll see a company is trading for a low P ratio and then like you do a bit of digging and you're like, oh, this happened and it affected, it was a one-off thing for their earnings. Yeah. There is always these cycles like um, air, the air industry will always have a price earnings ratio of eight, nine and high dividends. And uh, in good years, like it was 2019, They will uh, pay a lot of dividends, do huge buybacks, and always look cheap. And then we all know what happened in 2020. Mm. Banks, insurance companies, you will always see the stock price, and you will see all the banks trading at the price earnings ratio of 8, 9, and paying 5, 6, 7% dividends in good years. The problem is that a lot of those go bankrupt when there is a recession. So airline companies often struggle in recessions. Absolutely, because their margins are thin. And uh, when you have thin margins, then if your revenue goes down, 
you go immediately for making a lot of money, you go mm. to losing a lot of money. And yeah. then if you have that, and if your management always assumed that the world will remain stable forever, like all airline companies want and always do, they know there are risks, but the management is not paid to think about long-term risks. They are paid to maximize the stock price in the short term. Yeah. So it's not that the management is bad. They are just doing their job. If they don't maximize short-term stock prices, they will get fired. Hmm. Ah. So, so they are just incentivized to push that stock price up. That's their first yeah. goal. If you push your stock price up, you are a genius. Yeah. But if you... And there is always the risk that you destroy the company long term. So airline companies were all doing huge buybacks in 2019. And then in 2020, they all asked for bailouts. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. All of them were bailed out. Yes. Like banks in 2009, 2007, eight buybacks, dividends, 2009 bailouts. But the fact is that all the shareholders are screaming at the management, do more buybacks, take, take leverage, everything is great. And they do it because the shareholders want them to do it. Mm. That's why Buffett survives, because he has nobody shouting at him to do something. Yeah. And he set it up very specifically when he originally, or when he did his partnership and all that, he like did it so that he won't have anyone saying, oh, what's happening here? Swing, yeah, swing, just, you dummy, or whatever. Yeah, just think he, for the last six, seven years, has been sitting on a cash balance of 100 to 150 billion. Yeah. Just sitting there. Any other Wall Street company would have fired him and forced the company to do buybacks because that would have pushed the stock price higher in the short term. And he never did it. He just waited. Now, now that is inflation, now he is spending a little bit of that money. But he was just always waiting for that safety. Lowered likely his short-term return a year ago, two years ago. Everyone was saying Buffett is old. He didn't beat the index. He didn't do this. Now, of course, that has changed already. But that mm. just shows you how the risk and reward of doing business is applied on Wall Street and with real business owners. So is that kind of the key difference between Buffett? Like he's, because uh, how did he, I didn't, how did he set it up so well? Is it just because he writes to his investors and he explains everything fully and they have set expectations of, they know what's happening? Buffett is away from Wall Street. That's the key difference. And he understands the cycles of Wall Street and he takes advantage of those cycles. But he has to be separated from Wall Street. Thus, uh, they have he is the owner and he and Charlie make the decisions. And that's it. There is no board telling them we should push the stock price. We should do this. We should do that. No. And that's the difference. If you have a Wall Street board, if you have pension funds and own, as owners, they will all tell you, okay, do buybacks, take more leverage, push the stock price higher, everybody happy. And then when problems arise, oh, the government bail, will bail you out usually. Yeah. That's uh, interesting how the government doesn't, doesn't mind the fact that even though you've uh, done all this, they're still, then they don't mind still bailing them out. They have to do it because uh, you have to think, okay, what's the alternative of not bailing uh, out companies, banks, etc. Yeah. Then you will have riots on the street, yeah. and nobody wants that. So, uh, yeah, it's difficult. It's always a difficult position, but so they have to intervene and uh, try to go for the least painful solution. Mm. So, um, when do you decide to pull the trigger on a stock and buy? What kind of criteria has to be met before you're like, okay, uh, I'm going to go in to a stock? I have to like the cash flows, the business, and uh, I usually watch, look, okay, where is this go business going to be in five to 10 years? And then I usually aim for uh, 
12, 15% investing return. And when I think, okay, this business, it's very possible that it will likely double over the next five years. And then usually when things start getting good for the business, the stock will follow and do even more. So if I focus, okay, the business will double in five years, that's 15%. That's great for me from a business perspective. And then, of course, the lower the price you can get it, the higher will be your return when eventually the business develops. And Mm -hmm. if the business really does develop as planned, then the stock will follow and more. Mm -hmm. And then it's always I start buying when I like something and I like these cash flows, I like the proposition, what the business is offering. And if I still like the business and I if it keeps going down, I just keep buying and accumulating over time. Hmm. Um, so that that 12 to 15 percent return, does that change with um anything with like after a big bull market cycle, you start looking for lesser return or it's always, you always kind of aim for 12 to 15%. I, I always try to aim for uh, double digit returns. And then the more, the more things you look at and the more patience you have, you usually find something because if you look at any stock, most likely that that stock will go in one year, will go up 50% and will go from the top, will go down 30% down. That's usually how each stock moves. 50% up, it's very possible in every year and 30% down. And when you look at these stock fluctuations, look at any chart of any stock, especially over the last five years, you will see a big run up in 2000. 19 big down in 2020 big run up ups and downs and now they are already most stocks are now down 30 percent from the peak in uh, december january right um well some are a lot of the big ones are right yeah yeah yeah. so that's normal volatility and then if you let's say focus on the business that is much more stable you will always find opportunities around those uh, ups and downs and cycles. Mm. And if you follow 20 businesses, I'm sure that one of those 20 in each year will fall into a great buying. And that's all you need. If you find one business to buy in a year and you buy that one and you are set for life. Mm. So you often find opportunities. You don't struggle as much to find opportunities in like a year. No, you, you, you don't need many opportunities. As I said, you need one, and that's about, uh, and that's mm. about it. So, for example, before, uh, even in the pandemic and before that, I was very, very bullish on the copper market. So I was uh, looking at the whole copper sector because nobody liked copper. So mm. there were my opportunities. Then there were some other markets. In 2018, China... China uh, lowered uh, subsidies on uh, solar installations and the solar market crashed. But I looked at the trend, long-term trend, that it is still growing no matter the lower subsidies. So I bought the solar Mm. stock in 2018 that boomed until recently when the trend started reverting. Fortunately, I sold too early, but... Okay, I didn't. You never, you never catch the total upside, but mm. there is always something where the market doesn't look, doesn't want to look. A year and a half ago, China was the most loved place for investors, yeah, and now it's the most hated. Yeah, yeah. 2015, everybody loved China. 2018, they all hated it. 2007. Emerging markets were booming. 2009, emerging markets were the worst thing in the world. And you also always have these cycles and then you look how crazy the market is. And when there is a lot of pessimism, that is usually the best time to go fishing. 
Mm-hmm. What do you think about China right now? Like they've been hit really, really hard, right? Have you been looking on any uh, companies? I am there? looking at I'm looking at China, and I'm looking at what the media is saying about China and what is the reality. The yeah. stock market has been hit really hard. But the reality is that the economy, they are in lockdowns and everything, okay, and they still grow 2%. When the lockdowns were in the rest of the world, the, all the economies were falling 10, 15%. Mm. So when things pass and eventually things pass, then they should come back to stable levels of growth. And uh, then the market will again start loving them, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, with China, there is always the government intervening. And that's also something that the Western world uh, cannot understand, is that Mm. when there are exuberances and excesses, the the government says, okay, let's cut here, let's cut here, let's cut here. But, for example, there were the education stocks that went from very high to zero in a very short period of time because the government intervened. But if you looked at those business models, the business models were based on going around China, telling how the government has a bad education system and you have to give all your money to educate your child to these corporations educating your child. So if you go around China telling other people that the government is doing a bad job, you know that you will not do well. Mm. And you have just to understand also, it's a different culture, different government, different ways of going, different ways of working. And if you understand that, then you also again see those cycles. And now, especially now, everyone from outside China is mad at China because the stocks have been going down. Everybody hates it. And usually it is the best time to find a good bargain. Mm. Yeah, I guess a lot of people just worry about business and like communism and how will it work if things go wrong? Um, of course, all the time. But that that is something you A, can say, okay, I will look somewhere else. There are businesses also that are cheaper in the States in uh, Europe. So it depends on where you are looking, what you're looking for, what is your expected return. Mm. Um, when you look at China, are you looking more the sort of smaller companies companies, or the bigger ones like Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu? No, I think especially now with the situation, we don't have to go beyond the big names because right. all those small names especially have been pretty, pretty tricky and there is a lot of shenanigans going on, especially because when you are a Chinese company and you go to a foreign market, you are there and you have to please those, let's say, crazy gamblers on Wall Street. So you have to constantly push numbers better, better and better. And you are really incentivized to do crazy things, which then make sound an alarm with the government and uh, then it gets ugly. So it's very difficult to find the next small one because you have to really, really fish in an ocean of fraud or something like that. So maybe it's really better to just stick to what you know that works. So businesses that you see them working, creating value globally Mm. now, and then, okay, it makes things much, much easier. Of course, there is always risk. So uh, that's also something to think about. But as you build your wealth, your portfolio, you have to see how much risk you can tolerate. Mm. And so you think with the bigger companies in China, they're less, a lot less likely to sort of touch the numbers and whatnot? I mean, if you look at the big companies, we almost all are using some of their uh, products. So uh, if that continues, then and it's very difficult for that to not to continue given the connections that are global, 
then uh, everything should be uh, okay. Mm. But then again, it's always, you have to watch it and uh, see those cycles and how those cycles work. So it's not easy, but if you look at China, it is really, really cheap now. That's the truth. Um, so once you own your stock and you've bought it, what's your strategy from there? Are you still listening to earnings calls and reading the reports or do you take a little bit more of a hands-off approach? No, when, when I buy a business, I always listen to conference calls and earnings if the business is on track. If the business is on track, they are reinvesting into the business or doing whatever the reason was why I bought it. If they are making cash flows because I like the dividend and if everything is on track, then uh, I do mostly nothing. It has been, it has been, uh, let's say, a very, uh, very volatile environment over the last years. So the portfolio changed. I was invested in uh, Russia in 2020, uh, 2020, and then all those stocks started to going, going up. So I said, okay, the risk is going higher. And I started trimming. Then when you see the first tank, you sell everything because you know that uh, crazy things can happen because Russia is crazy and that has been confirmed. So I fortunately sold before everything bad happened. So uh, now and now I'm constantly looking at new businesses, investing and building the portfolio again from a new base. And so you go over the cycles and hopefully you go up. So I always find this an interesting question. When do you decide to, uh, no, it's not pull the trigger, but when do you decide to say, okay, I, I want to get out of the stock and sell? Uh, so as the price goes up, it's mathematical that the risk goes up and the reward goes down. And uh, if I buy a stock or a business that there was bad sentiment, and let's say for this solar stock, I bought it in 2018. I think it was at 60. Then it went to 120. Then it went to 220. And there I said, okay, I had enough because my value was, uh, my calculated cash flow value was 120. And when it went to two something, I already started thinking, okay, it's time to sell. Later, it went to 330, and now it's back to 90. <laughs> sure. So it's, it was really a crazy up and down. And then you always estimate, okay, what's the business value? So you look at the business growing, and you look at the stock price going up and down around that business growth. I like mm. to buy here, and when it's much higher, when the market is exuberant, then especially if I have other opportunities that are here, then I usually sell to manage the risk and reward of the portfolio. Are there some businesses that you would never sell? I like. I know Warren Buffett. He said he wouldn't sell Coca Cola ever. But if you look at the performance and everything, it, the best time was to sell Coca Cola in 1999. Yeah. If he sold everything and reinvested in everything else that he reinvested, Berkshire would be a double now. Right. for example. So uh, he doesn't sell perhaps also because of size, because if he dumps 12% of Coca-Cola, he destroys uh, maybe the company, the share, who knows. So yeah. he really has so much money that he doesn't need it. I am much smaller. So yeah. if it is a great business, then the price must also be really, really great to sell. But if it is more like a risk reward situation or currently the best opportunity in the market, but not something to hold for the long term, then I'm much easier to pull the trigger and sell. Hmm. Because the difference between, let's say, Buffett and Seth Klarman, Seth Klarman says that the longer you hold something, the longer, the bigger is the risk that something bad happens. So he is a value investor, but about shorter 
holding periods. Okay, buy value, catalyst. Okay, value has materialized, sell, next. Warren Buffett is more about that long-term owning businesses and compounding. But if you look at his portfolio, he also tests a lot of businesses, does a lot of sales. He just, he bought Verizon in 2020. He sold com the complete position, 8 billion positions. So uh, he decided, no, it's not really that good. And then you really compare. If a business grows at 15% and the stock grows at 15% per year, I'm not going to sell because the stock is just following the business. But if a stock goes up 100, 200%, the business is still the same, then I might consider mm. taking some chips off the table. Mm. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about how you balance your portfolio with, with cash, with different sectors and industries, with countries. Do you have a mindset around how you balance it? Not really, not really. Maybe that is something to work on, but I'm usually going for uh, the top three, four ideas that I have and that's it. Right. So I usually put all my eggs into a few baskets and watch the baskets carefully, hmm. which is think? opposite to modern portfolio theory or something like that. Everyone says more diversification Mm. But if I understand the risk and reward well, then uh, I like to be more concentrated. Mm. What do you think about holding cash in, in particular in this environment? Depends on the opportunities you have. Yeah. So I still now have about 20% cash because of the sales I've made in uh, late 2021, etc. And I have a little bit of exposure to, let's say, volatility, China. And now I'm waiting with that 20% for commodities or something else where I always watch and then wait for them to come to a buy position. And uh, so I now have about 20% cash. Hmm. If other stocks, if all the other jump, don't know why, in the next six months, I might go to 100% cash. If something else goes down, I might go to 0% cash. It depends on the risk reward in the, in, the, in the market or in the opportunities. But usually I will be likely mostly invested mm. because it's more about holding good businesses and then waiting for them to get to a certain level. Mm. Like generally, you'd rather hold businesses than than cash. Is there um, absolutely because yeah. cash is really losing value day by day, and it's made to go to zero over time. So yeah. uh, cash is really an let's say an, uh, not really my favorite holding. Uh, I prefer to own a business, and if I can find opportunities that I usually do uh, here or there then I am uh, happy to spend and be zero cash. And going back to the previous questions, I have three or four positions usually in my portfolio, but it's usually at least three completely separate stacks. So for example, China, I have now a volatility hedge, which is a business. If there is volatility, it makes money. And now the third pillar is cash because it's waiting for another opportunity. Mm. So you're, um, you're not afraid to go 0% in cash at times? Or do, do no, no, no. I, that, that would be my favorite. favorite. So uh, now it's, un, let's say, uncommon for me to sit with a little bit of cash, but... Uh, just working, researching, and uh, waiting for that big opportunity, and then I'll likely put everything in when it comes. I'm always following the copper market. That I'm very, let's say, I am a specialist as I have been following it for years now. And uh, they assume copper prices will go down in 2022, 2023. If there is a recession, then they will go even lower. And uh, given all what's going on 
in the market and with commodities that would make a great buy. And uh, that's what I'm waiting for over the next year or two. That mm. might not happen because of the commodity super cycle. So if it doesn't happen, I'm okay with that. But if it happens, I will be very, very ready to deploy. I need there to... is also, if I have to wait longer, there are also some really, really good dividend stocks that are pretty, pretty stable. So that's also a way to park your cash with six, seven percent dividends that okay. are pretty safe. So that's also an opportunity there. Do you do that much? Uh, I now have a dividend stock that is about 20, 20 something percent of my portfolio. The yield is about 7%. So uh, I'm happy with that. But also the business is likely to double over the next five years. So uh, 7% dividend, business doubles, and there you have your 12 like good business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have a certain number of stocks that you like to own in your portfolio, or do you? not really worry about how many stocks you own generally? I, I have, uh, as I always test things, I have tested once to own 10 businesses and uh, the top three, four that I own did really well and uh, all the others below were just trouble. Okay, we you manage those positions over time, etc. But from then I said, uh, I will own three, four stocks in my core portfolio and that's it. So I really know where I'm putting my money, watch it carefully and uh, I prefer to work on that basis. Three, four stocks as your main portfolio, main percentage. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, and uh, when you are so more focused, then you also watch more things more carefully. Right. And uh, maybe in the future, uh, Maybe when I will have, let's say, a larger portfolio, maybe a little bit around, you can make some bets. You know, for example, I just looked at all those small caps and one it's traded on the London Stock Exchange. It's called the uh, Fed Expo. is the Ukrainian metal uh, iron ore miner. The stock price totally collapsed because their operations are, I don't know, a few rockets away from the from the war zone, but it they pay down debt, they have no debt. So uh, if Ukraine can win the war, you're likely looking at the four, five X uh, mm. there. Plus they pay the dividend, they are making money, iron ore prices are good. So uh, those are, let's say that is a risky bet that mm. if you have five of such bets, you will, 5x your money in two of those and uh, you will one will do nothing and two will go bankrupt yeah so if you look at the risk and reward you will likely on that betting part you will make your money you will double your money every few years but it is more risky let's say mm. so, so I... uh, now i'm not looking for those things as i am much more conservative but maybe in the future depending on uh, also at the end money is about your life and you have to see how what you are doing now impacts your life over impacts your life over whatever term short medium and long term because at the end we are investing to improve our lives mm. so that's really the key risk and reward i think people always have to think about so just thinking potentially about not owning stocks that are um, going to stress you out and make you turn over in bed. and that's, that's definitely so. And then you have to see, okay, do I want to have a more risky portfolio or not? And then, okay, how much can I allocate to that? And uh, if yes, okay, then you might have some fun. You might do really, really well. But the key is not to get not to get overexcited because people say, okay, I'm going to put 10% of my portfolio in risky bets. And then that year, it's great for that. 
And that 10% is now 30% of your portfolio. Mm. Usually people, what they do is, oh, I'm really good at this. Yeah. Let's put more. And then 2022 happens with all those bets going down 90%. And now it's suddenly the 30% or the 50% you have increased your position is suddenly Mm -hmm. 5%. Yeah. And that's something that's very hard for people uh, because they see that's opportunity. Sven says it is a 5x potentially, which it is, for example, the Ukrainian business, yeah. but it can also go to zero. Mm. And that's always the, it's always about the mind when it comes to investing. Yeah. Is it, um, do you think that most people can have that mindset or does it, can it just be taught or um what do you think i i don't know i i read all the comments on youtube and uh or when i make a video about mindset and s- some people simply don't don't get it mm. some people just look at stocks and uh, stocks just go up i put my money and uh, that's it so when stocks go up I usually get questions saying I have inherited a million. I will just put it here. It did good over the last three years and I want to double my money in the next three years. And we usually know that that I'm, I cannot tell them, no, don't do it. or uh, Because if I tell them not to do it and that thing doubles in three years, <laughs> yeah. then I lost the millions. So, but usually, unfortunately, they have these ideas I had uh, an email from a guy that put all his money in, in ARC funds at the top. Ah, uh, yeah. He said, the world is going to change, technology, this and that. They have a great vision. And now he's likely down uh, 70% with all his money. Yeah, I saw that with so, ARC Invest. Yeah, so that's all, always the trick with, okay, understanding your position in life, your finances, and how every finance decision impacts your life over the long term. I always discuss what can go wrong and what Mm. can go right. And then it's up to the individual to decide, okay, how does that fit me? Mm. Because we are all different. Mm. And I guess one important thing is to try just be detached from from it and... uh... Just keep your emotions in check and just 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 watch out for them. Like oh. the first rule of investing is never invest the money you need. Because mm-hmm. if you invest the money you need, then you cannot think clearly. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge problem because most people are investing to build their pension. Mm, which is and what they need. Which is what they need one day. They need one day to sell those stocks to live, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They need those stocks to do ten percent per year for the next ten years, and that might not happen. It happened over the last forty years, but over the next forty years, nobody knows if, if it will happen. And then you get to a bad situation. I had a colleague when I worked as a lecturer. He sold everything on March 9, 2009. He sold his whole portfolio 50, 60% down because he was afraid that he will lose his pension. He was accumulating a lot of money, sold down, and then he bought back again somewhere in 2016, 17. Uh Probably sold again. I didn't have contacts anymore with him, but... It was crazy how people react in desperation. They sell at lows and usually invest at highs. Mm. What do you do in those situations if you, like your colleague comes and talks to you about it? It's so hard for you because it's like you, you don't know I, what's going to happen. I just, I just looked. There was this uh, documentary on Netflix now about Shanti Bhavan, which is an Indian uh, school for charity that helps uh, poor people enter the society. And the owner that there moved to America when he was young, built a big business, sold that business, and now he helps with India. But he said that for that school that he made, it was a terrible year in 2009 
because he invested in some tech businesses and bought beachfront property in 2007, 2008. And then the funny thing is that I have about 10 people that I know that all bought beachfront property in Miami in 2007, 2008. And all of them lost all their money there. And I simply don't know how to um, how to talk to those people because they simply go with, with the flow because at that moment it looks like a genius investment mm. because real estate prices can only go up. But nobody talks about the negative side. And if you talk about the negative side, you're not the cool person at the party. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So do, do you uh, talk about the negative side or do you just try be detached from it and just... Uh, it's, it's, it, for example, also on YouTube, if you make a positive video, yeah. everybody loves it. If you make a video discussing the negative side, YouTube will also usually tell you fewer, fewer of your listeners are watching this video. Uh, so yeah. it's always or you make it like a doom and gloom video like everyone then you have all those doom and gloomers watching so mm. it's very very interesting how and especially as we make videos it's very in interesting you sense how youtube and the algorithm and the viewers react to a certain topic which is which is one of the reasons that also explains investing and just gives me a sense of where the market is, where the people are. For example, right. views, I don't know if you have uh, noticed it. Now, as the market has been going down, the views also have been going down. Did you notice that too? My views are down, yeah. So views are down. And then I have a friend that told me, Sven, I'm rich and I'm in shape. He's 50 years old. All my colleagues from university are fat and not rich. And he said, and then I was thinking, what was the difference? We all went to the gym when we were 22. I just never stopped going. He's now 50 something. He's in shape. We all started investing in the dot-com bubble or something like that. Of course, I lost some money, but I never stopped investing. Mm. And now I'm rich. And I see already views are going down. People are stop stopping to invest. Now that things are cheaper, that things are getting better from a risk and reward perspective, yeah. views are going down, less people are investing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And over the long term, that's what makes the difference. It's like going to the gym. If you never stop investing, you end up rich. If you never stop training, you end up in shape. If you stop investing, you stop training, you end up fat and poor, likely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta you you want to own businesses over the long term. Generally, you want to be more of a buyer than a seller. That's actually you just want to constantly accumulate over over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sooner or later, th good things will happen. But if you stop doing it, and especially if you stop doing it when stocks are cheaper, then it's very likely that your returns will be very poor. There is this chart from uh, JP Morgan. I don't know if you can put it with the average Whatever. returns over the last 20 years. SAP 500, 9.5%, average investor, 3%. Because the average investor usually does the wrong thing at the wrong moment in time. Like now, views are down, investors are investing less, and now stocks are down. So things are cheaper and people are investing less. And that's a mentality that's, it's like a human nature, but I will never understand it. Mm. I think it must be human nature, eh? Because it, it happens in all parts of the world. That's people. They just like following trends and like stocks that go up. When stocks go down, nobody wants to buy it because mm. they are not investors. They're just gamblers. Mm. Do you think you can uh, teach the mindset change to people or is it just uh, very very difficult you warren buffett says that you are there either are or not and you know that in the first five minutes oh real 
and and there is uh, and then there is especially something very interesting with the stock market. Real estate investors are usually great investors. They have they know how to structure a deal, the rent, the risks. Okay, I make so much in cash flows that will likely grow over time. Stable, the real estate is there. I will never sell it, and that's it. Then they come to the stock market and they look. Okay, what stock will go up? And then I tell them, why aren't you applying the same real estate mentality to the stock market? Look at cash flows. What's your cash flow yield? How will it evolve over time? And they simply cannot, even great real estate investors cannot understand how the stock market works, that it is businesses. It's not stocks going up and down. So it's very, very hard to teach to people. So how can they do that for real estate? Is it just because it's, just more physical, they can see it, they can see the cash flows. Yeah, because they're, they are focused on the cash flows, not on the gambling. Of course, there are also many people gamble, but real investors, they know what they are buying, they know why they are buying. The cash flows will be reinvested in the next project, and they're just build their portfolio and they own real estate, they own the cash flows, they don't buy it just to see the stock price go up. With stocks, with all the media, with everything going up and down all the time, it's very difficult for people to focus on what matters, and that's businesses. Mm. Um, do you think in children, maybe you can teach it more? Or does it... I, I really, really don't know. Uh, children usually are not interested into finance. Yeah. You just yeah. start to be interested when you are uh, older. But I know that when I was a kid, I would look at all the prices of real estate. Mm. Uh, real estate agencies, I would look at all the houses, the prices, how to buy, how to invest. And uh, I had that since I was a kid. Mm. Saving money, uh, buying a stamp here because I grew up when people still used stamps, for example, selling it there for hire and things like that. So. Uh, Maybe it was just me. I don't know. Hmm. What is this? What is a stamp for? You put it on a for a letter. On a letter, send it. Ah, and you would buy yeah, it and then it sell it for more. Uh, yes, the collectibles. Ah, oh, people okay, used to yeah. collect stamps. God damn it! How old I am? <laughs> no, I think yeah. Well, we still use stamps though for to send a letter, but. We don't really see them. Uh, really now. now it's more all printed and things like that. But yes. Yeah. Well, we've already taken up over an hour of your time. So thank you very much um, for your time today. I'll just finish this. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I'll finish it with one last question. So what should beginners do who have the aim of getting high long-term returns? What would you recommend for them sort of books any books i see you got some books in the back uh courses youtube so i would recommend to start thinking to always first think think okay this is my money if i put it here how does that money work for me so always think the simplest way okay i put i buy this house i put a million in the rent over the long term with vacancy is 30,000. Okay, so if I put a million here, I get 30,000 as the money working for me. If I put it in this business over the long term, what do I get from the business? Eliminate stock prices, eliminate the market, eliminate crazy news, eliminate uh, CNBC, all those, eliminate YouTube, just focus on the business. Mm. that's a start and if you can do that then you will start looking at more opportunities enlarging your circle of competence and only then you can aim for higher returns mm. so just take it slowly start i would recommend that all people just start investing start learning and keep in mind it's a lifelong process you will not learn it in a day but slowly and steadily and put it to focus. I will do this for the rest of my life. And uh, it's inevitable that you end up well off, as Buffett would say. 
is there any like a uh, good basic books that you recommend i see you got security well, analysis security uh, analysis but that's a that's a hard one eh? no let's start with uh simple ones peter lynch beating the street where do i have it i don't know where it is so peter lynch beating the street is a pretty it's the best perfect book to start with okay it really mm-hmm. explains how he invests it's very well written uh, he's one of the best investors out there so uh that's a great start mm. yeah he, he's and got also a... peter lynch one one up on wall street and things like that so any book from peter lynch is simple and you can understand the key factors that are earnings that are businesses and then how those react in the stock market mm. Yeah, I haven't read any of his books before, but I've heard his talks and um, he speaks in a really nice, understandable, logical way. Yeah, and at the end, investing is about easy. So if you can understand it and if it's easy, then if you can understand the risk and reward, that's about it. Mm. As soon as it starts to get complex, it gets dangerous. Mm. Okay, well... Thank you for coming on. That was a, a really good conversation. And thank you for having was, me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was nice to finally meet you. We haven't even met before, but <laughs> um, so where can people find you? Obviously, um, your YouTube channel. Um, on my YouTube channel, yes. and then all the links, uh, all the I'll links put, are uh, to all what I do, my book, and everything is in every description of the video on the YouTube channel. Okay. There is my website, uh, www.senkalin.com. And yeah. if you want to put my email, I can send it. It's investwithsven at gmail.com if they have some questions or they can always send me an email. You can put it in. A... Mm. For those who have watched the whole video, you can put it down and uh, they can uh, contact me. For, no problem. Do you use uh, Twitter or Instagram or anything like that much? No, I cannot. I just uh, do mostly YouTube and uh, that's it. Uh, I cannot focus on other mm. other things. You also got a podcast, don't you? Uh, just the YouTube oh, okay. videos. My brother turns them, just takes, my brother takes the audio and put, puts it on all the podcasts. So uh, not right. specific podcast. No, 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 no. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on Cooper Academy. Thank you for having me. Okay. Take care.